Now one of the twelve disciples, the one named Judas Iscariot, went to the cabal of high priest and said, What will you give me if I hand Jesus over to you? They settled on 30 pieces of silver. So he began to look for just the right moment to hand Jesus over. On the first of the days of unleavened bread of the Passover, the disciples came to Jesus and said, Rabbi, where do you want us to prepare for you the Passover meal? He said, enter the city, Jerusalem. Go up to a certain man and say, the teacher says, my time is near. I and my disciples plan to celebrate the Passover meal in your house. The disciples followed Jesus' instructions to the letter and prepared the Passover meal. After sunset, he and the twelve were sitting around the table. During the meal, Jesus said, I have something hard but important to say to you. One of you is going to betray me. They were stunned. They began to ask one another, it isn't me, is it master? Jesus answered, the one who hands me over is someone I eat with daily, who passes me food at the table. In one sense, the Son of Man is entering into a way of treachery well marked by the scriptures. No surprises there. But in another sense, that man who betrays him turns traitor to the Son of Man. Better for him never to have been born than to do this. Then Judas, already turned traitor, said, It isn't me, is it, Rabbi? And Jesus responded, You have said so. He might could translate that, Don't play games with me, Judas. During the Passover meal, Jesus took and blessed the bread. He broke it and he gave it to them saying, take, eat, this is my body. And he took the cup. After thanking God, he gave it to them saying, drink from this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, the new way to live with God and with one another. It's poured out for you, and for many, for the forgiveness of sins. I'll not drink of this cup again until I drink it with you new, new with you in the kingdom of my Father. And they sang a hymn and then went straight away to the Mount of Olives, one of Jesus' favorite places, out away from the bustle of the city.
And on the way to the Mount of Olives, Jesus told them, before the night's over, you're going to all fall away because of what happens to me. There's a scripture that says, I'll strike the shepherd. And the sheep will be scattered helter-skelter. But after I am raised up, I, your shepherd, will go ahead of you, leading the way to Galilee. Peter broke in, Lord, they may all fall away, but I, I will never fall away. Don't be so sure, Jesus responded. This very night, Peter, before the cock crows three times, you will deny that you even know me. Peter protested, even if I have to die with you, I would never deny you. And all the rest joined in as well. Then Peter went with them to the garden called Gethsemane, which means the olive press. He told his disciples, stay here and I go over there and pray. Taking along Peter and the two sons of Zebedee, James and John, Jesus was plunged into agonizing sorrow. Then he said, the sorrow is crushing my life. Stay here, keep vigil with me. Then going a little further ahead, Jesus fell on his face praying, my father, if there's any way, let this cup pass from me, yet not my will, not mine, but yours be done. When he came back to his disciples, he found them sleeping. He said to Peter, can't you stick it out with me for an hour? Stay alert. Be in prayer so you don't wander into temptation without knowing that you're in danger. There's a part of you, Peter, that's eager and ready for anything with God. There's a part of you that's lazy, like an old dog laying in front of the fire. The spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. And he left them a second time. And this time he prayed, Abba, my father, if there's no other way to do this, but to drink this cup, then I'm ready. Your will be done. He came back and found them sleeping yet again. They just couldn't seem to keep their eyes open. This time he let them sleep on. He returned alone to pray a third time, going over the same, the same ground as the last. When he came back the next time, he said to them, <clears throat> Getting your rest? Gonna sleep the whole night away, boys? My time is up. The Son of Man is about to be handed over to, into the hands of sinners. So get up. Let's be going. My betrayer has arrived.
Jesus' words were barely out of his mouth when Judas showed up. Not alone, but with a gang from the high priest and the religious leaders, all brandishing swords and clubs. The betrayer had worked out a sign with them. The one I kiss, he's the one. Seize him. Judas went straight to Jesus kissed him on the cheek, greeting him saying, Shalom, Rabbi. Jesus responded, friend, stop with the charade. Then the gang leapt upon Jesus grabbed him. They, they knocked him around. One of those with Jesus pulled out his sword and swung it at the high priest's servant, cutting off his ear. Jesus said, put your sword back, back where it belongs. Those who live by the sword will die by the sword. Don't you realize that even now I could call on my father who could send 12 companies or more of mighty angels battle ready to defend me. But if I did that, how would the scriptures come true that say it has to be like this? Then Jesus addressed the mob. What is this? Coming out after me with swords and clubs as if I were some dangerous criminal? Day after day I sat with you in the temple and I taught you and you never even lifted a hand to me. But you've done it this way to confirm and to fulfill the scriptures, the prophets, And all the disciples abandoned Jesus. They ran away to save their own hides. And the gang that had seized Jesus led him before Caiaphas, the high priest, where the religious scholars and leaders had assembled. Peter followed at a safe distance until they got to the chief priest's courtyard. Then he slipped in and mingled with the servants, watching to see how things would turn out. The high priests, conspiring with the Jewish council, tried to cook up charges against Jesus in order to sentence him to death. But even though many stepped in, making one false accusation after another, nothing was believable. Then finally, two witnesses came forward with this. I heard him say to tear this temple, the temple of God, down. And in three days, he would raise it up again. Yeah, yeah, that's right, that's right, isn't it? I heard that too. Tear down the temple. In just three days, I'll rebuild it. 
the chief priest stood up and said to Jesus, What is your answer to these accusations? Jesus kept silent. Then the chief priest commanded him, By the authority of the living God, tell us now, are you the Messiah, the Son of God? Jesus was curt, saying, You said so yourself. But that's not all. See, soon you will see me. For yourself, you will see the Son of Man seated at the right hand of the Mighty One, arriving on the clouds of heaven. At that, the chief priest lost it, ripped his robe, yelling, Blasphemer! Why do we need any more witnesses? You've heard it for yourself. He is a blasphemer, and he deserves death. What is your sentence? What is your sentence? And they shouted, death, the death sentence. Seal it with a death sentence. They surrounded Jesus, started spitting in his face and knocking him around. They jeered and slapped him saying, prophesy, Messiah. Who was it that hit you that time? Now, all this time, Peter was sitting out in the courtyard. One servant girl came up to him and said, You were with Jesus, the Galilean. But in front of everyone there, Peter denied it. I don't know what you're talking about. He moved over to the gate, and someone else said to the people there, This man was with Jesus, the Nazarene. Again, he denied it, salting his denial with an oath. I swear it. I don't even know the man. Shortly after that, some bystanders approached Peter. You've got to be one of them. Your accent gives you away. Peter got really nervous. He cursed even, saying, Damn it! I don't even know the man! That's when the rooster crowed. Peter remembered what Jesus had said. Before the night is over, Peter, before the cock crows, you will deny. Deny me three times. Peter ran out, placed his face in his hands, and he wept. And he wept. And he wept.
bloody money. In the first light of dawn, all the high priests and religious leaders met and put the finishing touches on their plot to kill Jesus. They tied him up and they paraded him to Pilate, the Roman governor, the one with authority. Now Judas, the one who had betrayed Jesus, realized that Jesus was doomed. And he was overcome with remorse. He came back to the high priest to give back the 30 pieces of silver, saying, I have sinned. I have betrayed an innocent man. They responded, what's that to us? Sounds like your problem. Then Judas threw the silver coins down in the temple and he ran out and he hung himself. The high priest knelt down and picked up every one of those 30 pieces of silver. But they didn't know what to do with them, saying, wouldn't be right to put this in the offering for the temple, being its blood money. So they decided to get rid of it this way. With it, they bought the potter's field and they used it as the burial place for the homeless. That's how the field got its name, Field of Blood. A name that has stuck to this day. And Jeremiah's words became history. He wrote, long ago they took the 30 pieces of silver. And the price, it was the price of the one priced by the sons of Israel. And they purchased the potter's field. So even now, Unwittingly, they followed the divine instructions to the letter. people's boat. Now, Jesus was brought before Pilate, the Roman governor, who questioned him, are you the king of the Jews? Jesus replied, you say so. But when the accusations rained down hot and heavy from the high priest and the religious leaders, Jesus said nothing. Pilate asked him, do you not hear that long list of accusations? Do you not have something to say for yourself? But Jesus just kept silent. He didn't speak a word. They pressed the governor. So that he remembered an old custom that at the feast of the Passover, the Roman governor to pacify the people would pardon one prisoner whom the crowd chose. Democracy at its finest. Now at the time they had the infamous 
Jesus Barabbas in prison. So with a crowd before him, Pilate asked, which prisoner do you want me to pardon? Jesus Barabbas or Jesus who is called the Christ? Now he knew that the religious leaders had delivered Jesus over to him out of sheer jealousy. Now, while the court was still in session, Pilate's wife sent him a message saying, don't get mixed up in judging this righteous man. I've just been through a long and troubled night because of a dream, a dream about him. Meanwhile, the high priest and the religious leaders, they stirred up the crowd to ask for not Jesus Christ, but Barabbas. So when the governor asked, which of the two do you wish for me to pardon? They cried out, Barabbas! And what do you want me to do with Jesus, the Christ? Crucify him! Crucify him! Pilate responded, stunned, but for what crime? The people just carried on shouting, crucify him, crucify him. Now Pilate saw that he was getting nowhere, and that a riot was imminent. So he took a basin of water and he washed his hands in full sight of the crowd, saying, I am washing my hands of the responsibility of this man's death. He is now in your hands. You are the judge. You are the jury. The crowd answered back, His blood be on us then, on us and our children. Then Pilate, who really had the authority and the power all along, made his decision politically expedient decision to release Barabbas. He handed Jesus over to be whipped and then to be led away to be crucified. killing God. The soldiers assigned to Pilate, the governor, took Jesus into the governor's palace, got the entire brigade together for some fun. They stripped Jesus, dressed him in a red robe, they plaited a crown of branches of a thorn bush and set it on his head, put a stick in his right hand for a scepter. Then they knelt before him in mocking reverence. Bravo, King of the Jews, bravo. And they spit on him and hit him in the head with a stick. When they had had their fun, they took the robe off and put his clothes back on him. 
And then they proceeded out to the crucifixion. Now along the way, they came upon a man from Cyrene named Simon. They made him carry Jesus' cross. Arriving at Golgotha, the place that they call Skull Hill, they offered Jesus a mild painkiller, a mixture of wine and myrrh. But when he tasted it, he wouldn't drink it. After they had finished nailing Jesus to the cross, they waited for him to die. They whittled away their time throwing dice for his clothes. Above his head, they posted the criminal charge against him, a sign that read, this is Jesus, the King of the Jews. Along with him, they also crucified two criminals. One on his left, and the other on his right. People passing along the road, they jeered at Jesus, shaking their heads, saying, You bragged that you could tear down the temple and rebuild it in three days. Show us your stuff. Save yourself. If you really are the Son of God, come down off of that cross. And the high priest, along with the religion scholars and leaders, we're right there mixing it up with the crowd, having a great time as they poke fun at Jesus. He saved others. He can't even save himself. King of Israel, is he? Then let him come down from that cross. And we'll all become believers then. He was so sure of God. Right? Claimed to be God's own son, didn't he? So let God rescue him these so precious to God. Even the two criminals who were crucified next to Jesus, they joined in the mockery. From noon to three, the whole earth went dark. Around mid-afternoon, Jesus groaned out of his depths, crying, Heli, Heli, Lamak Shabachthani, which means, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Some bystanders who heard Jesus cry out said, he's calling for Elijah. One of them ran and got a sponge soaked in sour wine and lifted it on a stick so that Jesus could drink. The others joked, don't be in such a hurry. Let's see if Elijah comes, comes to save him. And Jesus cried out again loudly. Ah! And 
and he breathed his last. At that moment, the veil of the temple that separated the Holy of Holies was torn in two from top to bottom. And there was an earthquake and rocks were split into pieces. What's more was the tombs were opened up and many bodies of believers asleep in their graves were raised. After Jesus' resurrection, they left their tombs. They too entered the holy city and appeared to many. captain of the guard and those with him who crucified Jesus when they saw the earthquake and everything else that had happened they were terrified and they exclaimed this has to be the son of God also quite a few women watching from a distance. Women who had followed Jesus from Galilee in order to serve him. Now late in the afternoon, a wealthy man from Arimathea a disciple of Jesus arrived. His name was Joseph. He went to Pilate and asked for Jesus' body. Pilate granted his request. And Joseph took the body, wrapped it in clean linens, put it in his own tomb, a new tomb only recently cut into the rock. He rolled a large stone across the entrance. Then he left. But the women, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary, stayed, sitting in plain view of the tomb. After sundown, the high priest and Pharisees arranged a meeting with Pilate. They said, Sir, we just remembered that that liar announced while he was still alive that after three days, he said, I will rise again. There's a good chance his disciples will come and steal the corpse and then go around saying, he has risen from the dead. He has risen from the dead. And then we'll be worse off than before. The final deceit surpassing the first. Pilate responded, you have a guard. Go and secure the tomb as best you can. So they went, secured the tomb, sealed the stone, and posted guard.